Today's lessons, three of them, are each worthy, quite honestly, of their own sermon. But don't worry, I'm not going to give you three sermons this morning. But instead, what I want to do is tie some themes together that are common, in fact, to all three, because they, they sort of fit together like a puzzle. The context of the flow is Thursday, even though probably most of us weren't here, we commemorated the Feast of the Ascension, which is why we sang the line that we did, um, Alleluia, not as orphans are we left in sorrow now in the opening hymn, Alleluia, sing to Jesus. And the Ascension story was told in the first reading in the book of Acts. So if we're sort of living in this chronologically where we are, is that Jesus has ascended into heaven, but Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where we, as Jesus says in the gospel, in the Acts lesson, shall be clothed with power from on high, has in fact, in chronology speaking, yet to occur. So that's Acts. In other words, the command in the book of Acts is, I have been with you in person, but now I'm going to be with the Father, and the reason that I'm going to be with the Father is not to leave you as orphans, but to make way for the third person of the Trinity, who is the Holy Spirit, who will come and pour out the very divine life that you have seen in me will now come and be upon you, clothed with power from on high, Power meaning the Greek word is dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite. In other words, as somebody said uh, not long ago, Pentecost is actually the celebration of our incendiary nature. We are on fire. And so that's what Pentecost is all about. So we're in this position of being in waiting mode for something that we have yet to be have yet to receive if we're following the chronology of the liturgical year but in truth pentecost has happened and we who are christ's enjoy the very presence of the holy spirit inside of us now if for whatever reason that is not true for you then i would encourage you to ask because jesus promised that he would pour out his spirit on all who belong to him. In fact, the promise is all flesh. And so that means there is no reason in the world if you have said yes to Jesus, that the power and presence and the vibrant life of the Holy Spirit cannot be yours, both within you as well as surrounding you. And everything that we're going to walk through in baptism and in confirmation affirms that central truth that what we believe is that in our commitment to Jesus, he pours out his grace and his life and his love, his extraordinary dunamis presence in us. And, and I'm, I'm here to testify this morning, if I can use that revivalist term, that in fact, I know that in my life. I know the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, and I am grateful to God for it, because let me tell you, God asks you to do things that you cannot do on your own. You need the presence of the Holy Spirit to be able to do it. In fact, I believe that it even goes so far, that the scripture goes so far, is not merely to suggest, but actually state quite plainly that God intentionally puts you in places where you are over your head where you have to rely on that presence and that power. And it's a way of him breaking down our pride to show us that we're not the hot stuff that we think we are. And instead, that God breaks us and builds into us a kind of humble character where we yield to him. But it is in yielding that we, in fact, are able to receive the very things that he longs to give us. You see, God is not cruel. He loves us deeply, dearly, and passionately. And therefore, he wants to give us every provision that is necessary to walk through even the darkest of circumstances. And you see, that takes us right to the epistle. 
Because the letter from 1 Peter is written to a group of people who are being persecuted, who are suffering, specifically, not because they're obstinate, cranky people, but they are suffering because, in a very specific way, they are paying the price of their Christian commitment, living in a society that wants nothing to do with people who are believers in Jesus. That is not a field from many the, thing, the reality that many Christians across this planet know right now. In fact, I don't know whether you've seen it or not, CNN and a few other people have headlined the plight of a particular woman, a Sudanese Christian, who is pregnant, married to an American, both very clearly Christians. She's in jail. And there are people who are doing all that they can to try to get her out of jail. She is in, in jail for one reason. And for one reason only, it is because of her public commitment to Christ. And um, at this point, she is still in jail. There was an earlier news report that perhaps she had been released, but it's not true. She actually has had her baby in jail in the past week. Um, and the thing is, is that this is not a tragic anomaly. In this global Anglican communion of which we are joyfully a part, many Christians in many countries are suffering the very same plight of this particular woman. The only reason, in my opinion, that she is being highlighted is because she's married to an American citizen. She Sudanese. But the fact of the matter is, is that you could name, whether you're talking about North Korea, whether you're talking about most of the Islamic Middle East, whether you're talking about Pakistan, I mean, you could just sort of name country after country after country, where as a minority religion, Christians are suffering severe persecution. And per First Peter writes specifically to those people who are suffering because of their commitment to Christ. I met with the confirmands prior to the service beginning. And I walked them through the choreography of what happens when they get confirmed. And one of the things that happens to them is that they get a slight slap on the cheek. And I said to them, there are two reasons that this happens. Number one, it's an ancient part of confirmation. But it's an ancient part of confirmation for a reason. The reason is, is because confirmation in part is a commitment to be available and to serve Christ even if it gets difficult specifically because of your Christian commitment. In other words, as I say to some, confirmation is not for whiners. It's for men and women who are willing to think carefully and seriously about the price that could be asked of them specifically because of their public Christian commitment. And what Peter says to those who are suffering is that it is not a sign that you have been abandoned by God. Just the opposite. It is, in fact, a sign that God is pouring out his life and his grace upon you, that there is cause for joy even in the midst of extraordinary suffering. And it is, in fact, a sign that God is doing his work through you. In fact, I would go so far as to say is that while we live in this country and are not objects of serious persecution, if there are not people who look askance, at least, because of your public commitment to Christ, it would cause me to wonder about how deeply, in fact, you are committed. Because the normative assumption of the scriptures is that if you are serving Jesus, if you are thinking carefully about what it means to serve Jesus and how that applies to you, the way you spend your money and how you order your time, what that does in terms of your relationships, how you think about life in your culture and in politics and in business and the arts, that in fact what you're doing is that you have relegated the Christian faith to a private sentiment that actually doesn't speak into the rest of your life. And the scriptures do not know of Christians that live with that kind of privatistic pietism. Just the opposite. What it means to call Jesus Lord, to yield to his authority, means all of who I am, relationally, personally, financially, culturally, 
all are submitted to him. And that my job is to say, I have come to do your will, oh my God. What would you have me do? And there will be times, if you take that kind of commitment with some seriousness, that it will bring you into conflict with some of your family, friends, and neighbors. It's guaranteed. And our job in the midst of that is to respond with graciousness, with kindness, with care, and with deep prayer because sometimes it is not easy. Again, we are often placed in situations where what is asked of us is above and beyond what we can personally muster. And we need God to give us what we cannot produce on our own. Especially when the cause winds up resulting in my need to forgive. My need to overlook fault. My need to be gracious in the midst of conflict. My need to offer that soft answer in the midst of anger and wrath. My need to think reasonably and carefully when it seems as if everybody else has just gone off their locker. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Who's speaking the truth there? Or if you have the courage to speak the truth, then what winds up happening, especially if you're in the midst of a group of people who all think you're kind of crazy, is that they shoot the messenger. We need the grace of the Holy Spirit to live with that kind of courage, that kind of graciousness, even in the midst of difficulty. And the glory of what Peter is saying is, God will give you what you need. God will give you what you need. And then that takes us to the last section, which is the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John really deserves its own almost Sunday school teaching where we sit down and hammer it through verse by verse. It's a prayer that's almost out of time. Yes, the context is Jesus is in the garden. He's about to be arrested. His disciples, you know the story, are all asleep. And Jesus, at one level, is utterly alone in terms of human support. So he turns in a way that is only, for me, astonishing. He turns to his heavenly Father and actually starts praying <laughs> for all those people that he knows is going to abandon them. And the prayer that he prays for them, as well as the rest of the followers, which means, you see, includes us, is that God would bind us together, give us a care and a compassion for one another, that God would unite us by the Holy Spirit, all under the authority of Jesus, who is our only Lord. And the promise that he will continue to pray that prayer. In fact, it says in Hebrews that Jesus lives to pray for us. I, I love that. That even when I'm in a position when I feel as if no one is praying for me at all, I know that Jesus literally is standing in the heart of the Trinity, making intercession, praying for you and for me that we have, in fact, an advocate in heaven standing in the very heartbeat of God, speaking our name, our name. That's what undergirds all of what it is that we do. So, number one, the promise of the Holy Spirit. If you've got it, thanks be to God. If you don't, you ought to ask for it. Secondly, because if you're going to make a commitment to serve Christ, then you will need his supernatural power because there will be times that will be very difficult. And you need God's strength and mercy to be able to get through them. You need the companionship of the Holy Spirit that Jesus describes. And yet, not only does God give us the presence of the Holy Spirit, but he literally undergirds our whole life with his intercessions and with his prayers. Even at this very moment, the Trinity is praying for you and that you are not alone and that God will work through you that which he desires so that what begins to happen in your life is that God uses you to be a blessing to other people. 
and to touch them with the very same grace and power that God has touched you. Because that's, you see, the point. The point of the Christian life is not just for me to feel better, although that happens. The point of the Christian life is not just so that I get to heaven, although that happens. The point of the Christian life is as someone who has been touched by the Holy Spirit, who has the assurance of eternal life in the depths of his soul, he or she chooses to say, here I am, God, use me, even though it might cost me. In the end, that's really the meaning of confirmation. Men and women who are willing to say, here I am, O Lord, send me. So as we walk through back to some confirmation, reception, and reaffirmation, I hope what happens to you is that you will, remind, you will be reminded of the promises that you made when you stood in their stead. Or if in fact that, that is a very distant memory, or perhaps never even happened, that in that time you will say yes to Jesus in a new way. That God would soften our hearts Tune us more and more to his love and to his grace and his mercy. And know that there is no one who upholds us, prays for us, and provides for us like Jesus. Amen. Amen.